MEMS Micromachining Overview. So, we, we talked a little bit about this, right? Last week we did the, um, what was it, the bulk etching? Or actually Tuesday, right? We did bulk etching upstairs in the, in the um, chem lab. That's what we were doing, right? Bulk, we're taking a lot of stuff out. You can see this picture here, these cantilevers, okay? They etched everything underneath those cantilevers out. This is, this is, a, this is a big silicon, thick silicon um, wafer, right? Um, see this scale here? What does it say? 250. 250. 250 microns is how long this little white bar is. So these are probably 500 microns or so long. And underneath... This is probably 250 microns underneath that was etched away. Okay? Thank you. So we etched underneath and we etched around the sides to make these cantilevers so they can swing in space. So that's bulk. Surface micromachining, as you see in this picture on the left, this is a Sandia process called Summit 5. It's surface micromachining. These gears are extremely thin. They're about two microns thin. Each gear tooth, okay, the gear teeth, let me uh, zoom in on it. Okay. This gear tooth here is about eight microns across. Right? Eight microns across. Eight microns is the size of a red blood cell approximately. Okay. So you can see how small this is. This is polycrystalline silicon, this gray material. Poly means many, right? Many crystals. So if you zoom in even more, I don't know if we have the resolution on the original um, graphic. It's about as close as we can get. You can see a little bit that it's kind of looks a little bit rough. Those are the, the individual little crystals. Now, of course, these edges are pixelated because of the image, okay? So don't get confused with that. But these are 8 microns across. They're about 2 microns thick. And they're surface micromachining. That means they're very thin. They're very flat, okay? Um, sometimes the, the Sandians call this 2 and a half dimensions, right? Not quite 2 dimensions. It's not completely flat. But it's not really 3D either. It doesn't go up out of the plane much. Okay? So they call it 2.5D. But it's very flat. It's the same processing that's used when you make computer chips. They use the same equipment. They use the same chemicals. Okay? So surface micromachining is typically synonymous with CMOS processing. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor, which is what process you use to make computer chips. So surface is flat, very thin. We build it generally on the surface of the um, crystalline wafer. Bulk is we're taking lots of materials out and we can combine these two. So that chip you looked at on Tuesday, the back of it we use bulk micromachining and the front we use surface micromachining because it's flat, right? So this is typically what's done in MEMS, these two. This other process called LIGA um, is, is a different type of process. It's really micro molding. It's if you want to make a very small mold and make large, not large structures necessarily, but tall structures. Right? It's not thin. It's thick stuff. It's very tall. So you can see this image here. If I zoom in on it, it's a very cool image. I believe this is copper. Okay, and look at the size. What's that say? So how, how thick do you think this is? If this is 100 microns all the way across, about 10, right? That's a good guess. And look, it's going, they're going in different directions. This is hard to make with surface micromachining. I don't think you can. Bulk micromachining, you can't really do it either. Okay? You need a different process. So these are copper structures, and these were made with a high aspect ratio uh, microsystems technology called LIGA. LIGA stands for Long Involved German Acronym. Okay? 
Lithography, Galvo, Opformung. Right? Lithography is, is they're using a photo process to transfer the pattern. The Galvo part is uh, electroplating. Opformung is, is a type of molding. So they're doing electroplating and molding at a very small scale. So this, these two structures are actually a result of a double exposure. So you get this set of structures going this way and then this set of structures going that way. Okay, and you can be very, uh, make very fine um, 3D type structures. This is, can be used as a filter. It's highly controlled. You can make these spaces here very, very precise. Most filters work on paper principle and you mash paper together, right? And if you mash it together just right, you can filter out very small particles but there's still some gaps and holes and there's a variety of, of um, gaps that can let bigger or smaller particles through depending on what you're doing. Um, this allows you to make a very, very fine filter, very, very precise. Um, since this is copper, you can, you can actually put a charge on it. Okay, if you put a charge on it, a voltage on it, then you can pull things out that are charged out of the water or air. Okay. So that's what this product was for. But you can make other things that are tall, right? Uh, and, and skinny, like the, the gear we showed the other day. All right, so we keep, um, we keep making small things when we need different processes to do that. And these are the three of the main types of processing used to make MEMS. Now, there are other ones that are used as well. Um, they're usually a combination of one or two or three of these other um, types of fabrication. Like you might ask, how do they make very small plastic parts? Well, there's injection molding that's done. So you can make the mold using Liga and then use injection molding to put the plastic into a very small mold and release it. And they have very tiny plastic parts. You might want to do that for bio applications. You want to make um, biofluidic channels in plastic, you can make a mold using Liga, and then you can do hot plastic embossing. It's like using a, um, an iron, and you push um, a hot stamp into the plastic, and then you move the stamp out, and you're left with the impression of the stamp. It's like branding. You know what branding is? Mm -hmm. But you do it into plastic. Okay, and you do it on a tiny scale. All right, so you would use Liga for that. So we use all three of these. Um, you can make MEMS just using surface micromachining. Um, a lot of the accelerometers do that. Um, or you can combine bulk and surface to create MEMS devices. And Liga, like I said, is, a, is something that's quite unique. Okay. surface micromachining. This is the flat stuff. Okay, so it can be described as structural and sacrificial layers being deposited, patterned, and etched on top of a substrate. Now that's a mouthful. What does that mean? Um, I'll show you in this picture if I can get it bigger. This is a, a very typical structure um, that you can make in surface micromachining, okay, you start with um, crystalline silicon, okay, then you add a layer, some sacrificial layer. A sacrificial layer is a layer that you remove later. So if I want to build something up, think about I'm building a balcony. I could just pile up dirt then build a balcony on the dirt, and when I'm done with the balcony, I remove the dirt underneath it, and then I have a freestanding balcony, right? That's one way to do it. That's how you would do it in the nano and micro scale, nano and micro scale. So I build up a sacrificial layer. This happens to be silicon dioxide, which you'll be etching in the clean room in a few weeks. Okay, so silicon dioxide, we put that down. Then we put a layer that is going to be the structure. Okay, 
So we put a thin structural layer on top. And then later we get rid of the silicon dioxide and we have a freestanding structure. Now notice we made a support anchor here because if we didn't do that and we removed the, the sacrificial layer, this would float away, wouldn't it? Right? So we have to hold it down somehow. So we've got to put a hole in the sacrificial layer. We've got to put a hole in it. So when we put down or deposit this material, it goes into the hole and makes a connection with the wafer and it won't float away. So that's why it's called a support anchor. So this is an anchor. Okay? So this is, this is all there is to it, to making those complex Sandia um, structures. But you can do it over and over and over again. So you put a sacrificial layer, a structural layer, sacrificial, structural, sacrificial, structural. You can connect one to the other in different places, and then you can create something that looks like this. Okay? So this is a side view of that gear I showed you before. You can see it's very thin and very big this way. This is a hub here, back here. That's so the gear can spin around something. And if you take my design class, you'll learn how to do that. And then this part here is called a flexor. It's actually connected to the gear a little bit off camera here. And this moves back and forth and in and out and pushes the gear in, in a circle. Okay? So that's not too bad, right? So the structures have low aspect ratio. That means they're not very tall and they're really wide. So if you take the height and divide by the width, that's the aspect ratio. The height divided by the width is the aspect ratio. So the, the, the height might be 2 microns in this case, okay? And the width might be 100 microns. So your aspect ratio is 2 to 100, okay? Short and fat. Okay? Now, if you're making a Liga part, it might be very tall and skinny. So, so now you might have an aspect ratio. The height would be 100, and the width might be 2 microns. So now you have a 100 to 2 aspect ratio. That's really high. Okay? So that's a high aspect ratio. So we've got low aspect ratio, high aspect ratio. Low is short and fat. High is tall and skinny. Okay? And it depends what you're making, if you want it short and fat or tall and skinny. Any questions? Okay, so this, the um, surface micromachining process is based on CMOS. That's complementary metal oxide semiconductor. That's what 99% of the computer chips you use today, that's the process they use. So you got metal, oxides, and semiconductors. You got three types of materials. Now the, met, the flavor of the metals will change. You know, the, the, the amount of doping in the semiconductors could be different. The thicknesses and types of oxides used will vary. Okay, but overall it's basically the same process. That's why you can have an Intel and AMD and applied materials, all of these uh, TSMC, all these big companies um, make computer chips and they all buy this, the equipment from the same equipment suppliers because the processes are basically the same. The details are different, okay, but the processes are about the same. It's like a truck. You can use a truck to deliver um, oranges, or you can use a truck to deliver nuclear waste. It's still a truck, right? Same process, getting from one place to another. All right. So here's some more cartoons of surface micromachining. I'm going to go right to this corner picture here first. So again, you do a layer of sacrificial material, a layer of structural material, sacrificial, structural, and you can make a very complex structure. Okay. Now remember, this is 8 microns. This is maybe 100 microns across. Okay. You've got this drive pawl here pulling on this gear, which makes it go around. 
Okay, and then you have another one here which can make it go around. So you have two inputs to make this gear go around. This gear goes around, it's connected to the gear underneath which drives these gears. Okay, and then look, underneath here you've got another gear. So you can do transmissions if they're different radii, right? So this is pretty cool. You know, you can do a lot of neat stuff uh, with surface micromachining. If we take a look at the process, okay, let's start on the top. We're going to go from the top down. All right, so we start with, um, we start with a sacrificial material. Again, right, this is the gray part. Then we, and on top of the substrate, which is usually the crystalline silicon, okay. Then we put photoresist on there. So what's photoresist? That's a material that's sensitive to light. So we cover the whole thing with photoresist. We shine light on it. We shine light here. We shine light here. It causes the photoresist to dissolve away when we put it in develop. You'll do that in the clean room. You're going to put photoresist on top of the silicon dioxide. So this is what you're going to do in the clean room. So you put the photoresist down. You shine light where you want to get rid of it. You develop it so wherever the light was gets developed away. So now we're, we end up with one piece of photoresist. Okay. Now that protects what's underneath when you subsequently etch it. Okay, so there's the photoresist. We etch, so we put it into a, either a wet etch or dry etch. Usually for oxide, we use a wet etch. It's isotropic. So what's iso? The same, the same in all directions, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if it's a wet etch of silicon dioxide, it's, it's going to etch the same in all directions. And it's only going to etch what's showing. So remember, the photoresist is protecting this. So you etch everything away. Once you're done etching, then you put it in another process that gets rid of the photoresist. So it's chemistry, right? You use different chemistry to get rid of different things. So now we get rid of the photoresist, and we're left with a structure. It's left over. And here's your sacrificial layer. You're going to get rid of that later, right? Because it's sacrificial. We're going to sacrifice it. Now, we've got this sacrificial layer in place. And we're going to go ahead and put something over it. Okay, it's like snow falling, so it's conformal. It covers that structure, so you get a bump here. That bump is important. You can think about it, right? You keep adding more and more stuff. I'm going to get bumpier and bumpier, aren't I? Anyway, we put the stuff down, we, we cover it with a, with a material. What kind of material? What does it say? Material, okay. So we put material on there. And in, semi or in uh, Sandia, we use um, polycrystalline silicon. Okay, we might cover it. That's our structural layer. This is going to be a structural layer. Then again, we put photoresist on here. Now look. I'm going to put it over the whole thing, then I'm going to shine light here, dissolve out the parts that had light shown on it, and now I'm left with photoresist over just part of this structure, right? You see that? Can you see that? So what do you think is going to happen when I etch it? What's going to disappear? Not everything. I'm going to just tune my etchant to get rid of this light blue stuff the material, the structural layer. So what part's going to disappear? This part or this part? The second one. All of this will get dissolved away. So then you'll end up with the structural layer underneath, right? Right here. This will remain. Okay? This will all go away. And then you're left with the photoresist protecting the, the structural layer. Then what do we do? You take away the purple. Take away the purple, the photoresist. Yeah, perfect. Does everybody get that? 
It's not too hard of a process, right? And it just repeats over and over and over again. Okay, so what did we do here? We got rid of the material, okay, and the photoresist. And then we put it into another etchant that eats away what? Bingo. Now you know exactly how computer chips are made. That's all there is to it. Okay? You know more than 99.99% .99 of the planet's population. But 90% of the planet's population uses stuff all the time. They have no clue how it's made. Now you have a clue. Okay? And did you say you used the acetone developer to remove the photoresist? You can use acetone to get rid of photoresist. That'll work. That'll dissolve it everywhere. But you need to use um, uh, TMAH developer to get rid of just the exposed photoresist. Photoresist, when it gets exposed to light, turns into an acid. So it becomes acidic. So if you take something that's acidic and you put it in a basic solution, there's a reaction that occurs. So the, the photo developer, one of the types is uh, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide, hence the name hydroxide, that's an OH. Right? We use, what did we use upstairs? Sodium hydroxide. Those OHs are really good at etching things, right? Mm -hmm. So you put um, uh, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide um, on top of the uh, photoresist, the parts that were exposed to light will dissolve away. Okay? Now I'm only talking about one type of photoresist, which is called positive photoresist. There's also negative photoresists that work in the opposite way, but they're rarely used. 95 to 99% of the photolithography processes use positive photoresist. There's several reasons for that. One is you can make finer structures with it. The chemistry is more advanced, um, and it's kinder to the uh, environment. Negative photoresists use things like xylene, you know, and benzene as, as solvents. They're all carcinogens. They're not friendly. They're not organic. Photoresists tend to have a lot of organics in it, so it's easier to um, take care of. It's a greener process. Okay? So there you go. So we'll go into detail on the sacrificial layer. I think you've got it now, right? But this is a good example. Ever hear of a keystone bridge? We have these a lot on the east coast because the colonies used to build keystone bridges across the creeks back in the day when they first came here. Europe has hundreds and hundreds of bridges that are keystone bridges. The way you make a keystone bridge is you put a scaffold up right after you build the two bases here, you, you put this wooden structure up in an in a arc. And then you place the stone. And the stones are specifically cut to fit really well. Right? Stonemasons were worth their weight in gold back in the Roman times. Right? And back in the medieval times when they were building cathedrals that would take 200 years to build. Beautiful structures. So you put all of these um, stones on, and the last stone, this last stone here, is called what? This is the keystone. It's the main stone, right? You put that in place. Once this one's in place, guess what? You can get rid of the scaffold, and the, and the arc will stay up. And if you do it well enough, you don't even need mortar in between these. And this, these bridges will stay up for thousands of years. The Romans still have keystone bridges um, that are standing. The aqueducts, a lot of the aqueducts are still standing. Same thing. Okay? Expensive to build, but lasts forever. Okay, so that's the keystone bridge. And the reason I always talk about the keystone bridge is because they create 
a scaffold. This is called a scaffold. A scaffold is temporary. We put scaffolds up when we're building something. So this is similar to the sacrificial layer. Okay. So the scaffolding when you're making a keystone bridge is analogous, similar to the um, sacrificial material you put into place when you're building your MEMS device. Does this make sense? Any questions? Why cannot you just do it? It's not possible. What's that? I, I understand the process, but I want to understand why you do it so complicated, like scientific. It's not possible just to glue it, is it? Sure, you could, but you'd have to make, you'd have to get someone to glue each piece together. And if you're making 20,000 MEMS devices on a, um, on one, um, on one wafer, you'd have to sit there and glue 20,000 things individually. Right? No, yeah, I was thinking more like in magnetic that can be together. Then you need magnetic materials and you have to figure out how to process those. So it's easier to do all these steps? Yeah, they make billions of computer chips a day in most factories. Just, you know, it's, you, you can. Since you're using a photolithography process, you're, you project an image onto the wafer. And you'll do this in the clean room so you'll get a better sense of it. But that image can contain 20,000 um, parts. Mm -hmm. So you do all the imaging at one time. You do all of the etching at one time. You do all the, all the deposition of all the material in, in one layer at one time. It's very, very efficient. Now, if you're only making one, maybe it's not as efficient. But if you're making billions or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands even, you know, this is the way to go. Okay? Now, they have tools that they can direct right into the photoresist. They use an electron beam. It's called electron beam lithography. And that's really cool because you can make a thousand different parts on one, on, on one wafer. The problem is, is you're drawing it out for each part, like an Etch-a-Sketch. Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time to do, to process. They use electron beam lithography to make the, the photographic plate called a mask, you know, and that, that might take anywhere from a half an hour to six hours, depending on the complexity. But once you make the one mask, you can make hundreds of thousands of wafers from the one mask and billions and billions of parts. Okay, so does that help you with a yeah. sense of, okay. So this is another uh, Sandian um, design, actually. This is uh, actually in the Guinness World Book of Records is the world's smallest chain. <laughs> Gesundheit, okay. So these links are about about 50 microns across. And it's a chain. It's a working chain. Now, one of my students designed a chain that was um, five times smaller than this. So we actually created the world's smallest chain. We just didn't put it in the Guinness World Book of Records. Because you've got to pay for that, and, you know. So our chain is a lot smaller, and um, we'll show it to you when you come to the, to the MTTC. We'll, we'll have a display of, our, of some of our small parts that we've made in the design class. So this is a really cool structure, um, but it's flat again, right? And you can see here we have, we have a transmission, a gear transmission, and a lot of people have a hard time conceptualizing that. You know, this gear goes around. The way this one is driven around is, is you've got a up and down and a left to right uh, motor. So if you time it right and get this going left and right, while this one's going up and down, this thing will be a circle, won't it? So if you have a frequency this way and a frequency this way and you add them up, you get a circle. If one's a little bit longer than the other, you get an ellipse. If one frequency is twice that of the other, you get a figure eight. OK? 
Okay, in this one, it goes up and down once per second. And it goes left to right twice per second, right? Is that right, or do I have it backwards? Okay, so you can get any kind of shape by moving things left, right, up, down. And it took a, Sandian's a while to get it just right so it goes in a circle. Because if you're off a little bit, this pin is going to jam and cause a failure in this gear. So you can make this gear go round and round. That drives another gear round and round, right? So this goes so many teeth per second. This goes so many teeth per second, right? This one goes what, faster or slower? Every time this goes around once, this goes around once. But these teeth are much slower. So you've got a transmission, so you can go, maybe it's 10 to 1 or something like that. Okay, so you get the idea. You can create transmissions. That's why you need a lot of layers. If you just put gears next to each other, it's boring. They don't do anything, right? The first one spins so many teeth per second, and the last one goes so many teeth per second. Well, if I want to make something faster or slower, I've got to be able to make, uh, make multiple layers to get that gear transmission working. Okay? So, enough said. So the materials we use, I've already talked about. We use silicon dioxide a lot as a sacrificial layer, and we use um, polycrystalline silicon as the structural layer, and in the industry they call it poly, okay, for short. When I started working at Texas Instruments, they kept talking about poly. I was responsible for polycritical dimensions. And it took me a couple of years to find out that poly wasn't, po uh, wasn't a polymer. I didn't know, no one told me, right? Poly is a polycrystalline structure. So, they call it poly. So in industry, there's a lot of shorthand. Silicon dioxide, they usually call it uh, oxide for short. Okay. So, um, sacrificial layers are also insulators, oftentimes. So we use silicon dioxide as an insulator. So if you don't want electricity going from point A to point B, you've got to put something in the way. So silicon dioxide is used in CMOS, making computer chips, as an insulator. So now you see a problem, right? If I'm making a MEMS device and I want to dissolve all the silicon dioxide at the end so they're free to move, I don't want to dissolve out the insulators, do I? So putting a computer chip and a MEMS device next to each other is a tricky thing. Okay? And they play some games and they, they isolate things and do things like that to, to keep you from doing that. Silicon nitride? You saw silicon nitride, didn't you? On Tuesday. What was the silicon nitride? Do you remember? Was it green? It was green. That's just because of its thickness. If we made it a different thickness, it would be a pretty blue. If we make it another thickness, we could make it look red. Yeah. Okay? But our, the thickness we choose to use makes it look green, so it was green. So it, was, it had the holes in the back, right? Yeah. So silicon nitride was used as a hard mask. Right, so on the back of the wafer, okay, let me get green here. On the back of the wafer, we had an opening, right, and this is all green. And the green was silicon nitride. So when we put the, the, the chip in the, what did we put it in, what solution? Sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. We use sodium hydroxide. It has that OH in there. The OH loves to do what? Eat the, what was this? That's open. That's, what, what material is this? That's the silicon crystal, right? So we eat away that. Okay? And this green stuff out here is silicon nitride. Potassium and sodium hydroxide don't do anything to silicon nitride. So not only is it an insulator, we also use it as a mask, a hard mask. Well, what about the other side of the chip? There was silicon nitride too, right? But what was it used for there? No, it etched all the way through. 
we want it to etch all the way through the crystalline silicon wafer. It's the, it was the what? The flexi part? The membrane? That we put the what on top? Come on. The circuit. The circuit, right? So on the other side, okay, so we had a structure. If you looked at the side view, okay, this is all silicon. Now well, let's make it black. This is all silicon, right? We etched from the, from the back to the front, right? This is the back right here. This is the front. So we etched all the way through. But if you remember, we had this thin layer of silicon nitride on both sides, right? Except on the back, it's open, so we can etch through. But it didn't etch the front, right? Because it was protected. Silicon nitride doesn't etch in potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. So we etched all the way through and it stops on the silicon nitride and wow, we've got a thin layer here that's the membrane. That's the flexi part. Okay, and then on top of that we, we did what? We had some circuits, right? Oh, I'm using the same color. That's not going to work. Right, so we had some circuits here on top. So when the, when the membrane bends, the circuit stretches. Okay, when the circuit stretches, it changes its electrical properties and we can measure that. So now we have a way of converting a mechanical motion into an electrical signal. All right. So that's why I wanted you to look at those chips on Tuesdays. You know, then now you can connect the dots, right? You, had, you saw silicon nitride and you saw um, the crystalline silicon. Okay, so now you have an idea that these different structures have different um, purposes. And then I always like to make you guys look at these pictures, these scanning electron microscope pictures. How big was the gear tooth? Eight microns. About eight microns, right? So a red blood cell would be about like this across there. So how many of you have seen a red blood cell under a microscope in bio? You guys haven't pricked your finger and done that in class? They don't really like that with blood pathogens, no. Now we can't do that fun thing anymore. I know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I know. I'm so sad. I know. You're lucky if you can find slides. Well, you could probably buy some prepped slides that are sterilized and then Take a oh, look at seal, it. Seal okay, but that's about the size of a red blood cell. So this is a bad analogy now, right? Because no one's ever seen one because they're not allowed to touch blood. Even though you see kids in the playground and they're always bleeding. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's get back to the task at hand. So this is like that cantilever I showed you, right? This is a freestanding structure. There used to be um, some silicon dioxide underneath there. Let's go ahead and play some games here. So there used to be sacrificial oxide in between that, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we dissolved it away, right? A after we were done patterning and etching, we dissolved it away. So now this thing can move, right? This can go up and down if you want it to. In this case, it's a clip that's holding this gear down so the gear doesn't flip up, right? So this is actually keeping the gear from going up, all right? So you can see we made a hole in the oxide so we can connect these two. And then we have another layer that's this structural layer. It's all one, it was all one piece at one time, and we etched away in between to free it up, okay? And then this anchor was anchored to the silicon, crystalline silicon. So we had to connect this to this, and then this to this. And now this whole structure is anchored down so it won't move away. But you can see, something as simple as this, you can build up. And see how it's conformal? Can you see how it goes in there? It's kind of cool. Okay. 
That's where the hole is that it had to fill in the silicon oxide. Okay? All right. So when you watch MJ's lecture, it's a lot different than mine. She doesn't go into this detail. And she, she covers it on a very basic level, just what's necessary to understand for the questions. I want to take you a little bit further down the path to get you familiar with how it's applied in the real world. Okay? So I, I still recommend you listening to her lectures because it'll tie everything together and it's shorter than mine. Okay. This is the chemistry. This is how you um, create silicon dioxide. And this is how you, um, there's, you know, you can do it dry or wet. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. We're going to have a rainbow wafer unit later that will talk about oxidation. But there's two ways you can make SiO2. Um, you can grow SiO2, I should say. So this is like rust, right? Mm -hmm. And you leave metal out in the air. The oxygen combines with the um, Fe, the ferrous, right, the iron, and creates FeO2. Mm -hmm. If you use water, it, it, makes, it grows the rust thicker and faster. Same thing happens in silicon. And we'll skip the part where it's, why is it faster if it's water? Many of the teachers know? Did you go to the rainbow wafer workshop? I think we explain it in there. Anyway, you get the idea, right? So you All right, photolithography. So we talked about that. We expose the photoresist with light and wherever the light hits turns into a, the photoresist turns acidic. The acidic part can be washed away with developer. So how do we get that pattern? those complicated gear structures and things like that onto the um, photoresist so that we can develop the pattern and then later etch what's showing, right? So we're going to protect the parts we want to leave behind. Well, we use photolithography. So there's several steps to that, and you get to do this in the clean room. So you'll see it again and, and do it yourself. You coat the wafer with photoresist. Then you expose it to light with a pattern that you're going to make. You're going to create your own pattern. Then you're going to develop the photoresist, okay, by putting it in something similar to tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. It's another base. It's not that one. It's another one that the industry uses, and I can't remember the name. I, the trade name is AK400, uh, I think, or 400K or something like that. Anyway. It's a basic solution, so that's the developer. And then once you develop it, then you have a pattern on there, and then you have to bake it to get the resist a little bit harder so it stands up to the subsequent etching. If you don't bake it, then the photoresist may fall apart in the etching. So you bake it, make it a little bit stronger, okay? So coat, expose, develop, bake. Once you have the pattern and you have it baked on with the photoresist, then you etch it. So whatever's showing gets etched away. Right? Then you strip the resist off of there. So you etch the pattern in to the subsequent or the previous material layer. Then you remove the photoresist. Okay, then you put the next layer on and repeat. Clover George, please call extension 6008. Clover George, 6008. All right, and then you repeat it again and again and again and again, and you make these complicated structures. Okay, and then when you're all done, you do a release. That's an important term, release. Release means you release the structures so they are free to move. Okay, and that's done by putting the material in something that dissolves, um, that dissolves silicon dioxide. Okay, so we use hydrofluoric acid for that. Nasty stuff, don't get that on you. When you go in the clean room, we will be using hydrofluoric acid, but Matt will be doing that part. Aww, you have no. 
Because if you get a drop of it on you, I have to take you to UNM Hospital. You have to be treated with calcium gluconate. If you get more than a few drops on you, you can kill you. So we don't want to kill any of our students. Got to go? Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Two students left. <laughs> okay, so that's the release part, is the, the part where you dissolve the sacrificial materials away. And then once you do that, then you can take your, your little gadget and put it in a package and put electrical connections to it and put it in your cell phone, right? So if we look at this closely, right, let me explain to you this graphic. This is the mask holder, this is the photo mask. So you're going to make your own pattern, your own picture, and transfer it to the wafer. So that's kind of cool. Have I shown you some of those patterned wafers yet? No. Did I show you the puppy? In oxide? Not yet? Okay. I got to bring the puppy in. Um, so you, you have a picture. In this case, it's a circuit. You guys are going to do art. You transfer the light through there. So wherever there's chrome on the, on the mask, and in your case, it's going to be dark um, ink, right? Because you're going to use a transparency. Wherever it's dark, the light doesn't go through. Where it's clear, the light goes through. And we put a lens in, in between. Now, in our fab, we're going to not shrink it. Okay, but most systems, they, they shrink the pattern. So you can draw something big and make something small, okay, by shrinking it with the lens. And then, in this case, they're using a stepper, so they expose, you know, over and over and over again, the same pattern. That's the same pattern. Yep, the same pattern. So they do the same pattern, they step it, that's called a stepper, the machine. A stepper can be anywhere from a million dollars to one hundred million dollars. Okay? So that's why the technicians that know how to fix these things get paid a lot of money. The engineers that know how to process and use the machines, they make a lot of money. Okay? Also, when the machine breaks, everybody's waiting for it to get fixed. So there's a lot of pressure. That's why you get paid a lot of money. Okay, if a $100 million machine's not making anything, you're losing how much per hour? A lot. Right? It depreciates in, in five years, so that's $20 million a year. That means every week it's worth $500,000. So every hour, right, it's not $10 an hour. It's not $1,000 an hour. It's about... Four to five thousand dollars an hour. Okay, when the machine's not working. So that's why they pay the technicians who can fix it in two hours a lot more than the technicians that it takes three hours to fix. Right? Makes sense. So going to school, learning all of these different terms, applying mathematics, chemistry, all of those sciences. You know, it's important to understand how these things work, and then that way you have a better appreciation how to get them fixed. Figure stuff and problem solve stuff out better. So here's a side view. I really like this graphic as well. It's a side view of what's going on. So here we've patterned a circuit, and if you t draw a dotted line across it, it'll look something like this. It's not quite accurate, but you can see here's the photoresist right here. After we developed, these are open. So what's going to etch? What's going to disappear? What part of the blue is going to disappear? This part or this part? Second one, right? So what shows goes, right? So we etch all of this stuff away, okay? And look what we end up with. All right, now you're getting it, right? I've repeated this how many times? Okay, now what do we have to do? We, we, we patterned it. Everything's done, right? But there's something else we have to do before we put the next layer on. Got to get rid of this. So as Mr. Shum um, alluded to, you know, you put it into a developer. You can use acetone. Acetone will dissolve photoresist. Okay? 
We also will, we can put it in a, in a plasma, an oxygen plasma tool, a reactive ion etcher. Oxygen at high temperature, this is an organic, does a great job cleaning it off. And then we do a, a, um, a wet um, deionized water rinse after the plasma etch of the, of the um, photoresist. Okay, so there's different ways we can strip it off. There is something called ACTMI, which is photoresist stripper. It's really nasty stuff. We stopped using it at Phillips or at, and at Texas Instruments because it, it causes testicular atrophy and maybe birth defects. So, you know, it's not something people want to work around, right? So they, they have an, another type of um, stripper that, that isn't as dangerous if you get it on you. Okay? So, like I alluded to earlier, we have a problem. We have a problem, right? You can see we have a structure here that we built. And we put an oxide layer above it. And you can see this bump here. Can you see that? Let me zoom in on it. Oh, it's as zoomed as I'm going to get. No, oh, there it is. It's a little pixelated. Let's try to draw it. So my oxide, which I'm going to draw blue, when I put it down, oops, had a bump over it. And that bump was because of this structure here. It's a thin structure. You can see it's pretty thin. So the bump's not that pronounced. OK? But it's still there. So when I put the next layer on, you have the bump again. So you can imagine if I keep building more and more parts, it's going to get really, really bumpy. We have a problem with topography, that term topography. Ever hear that term? You use it when you look at maps to see how tall a mountain is. Topographical map. Well, we have a topographical map of our wafer now, right? Of our product, of our device. So it's, it gets bumpier and bumpier the more and more stuff we pile on top of each other. What happens if you have two bumpy structures that are supposed to slide over each other, like two gears? They're going to crash into each other, right? OK. So we got to get rid of those bumps. Here we go. So Sandia had, had to learn this the hard way, right? Because when they started making MEMS, they didn't think about it. Right? When you design things on a computer, it looks pretty. Everything's perfect. And then when you build it, it doesn't work. And then they had to learn and say, OK, what do we have to do to make it work? Well, what they found out is, OK, when I put my oxide here, it went down and back up over the gear I just made, right? See that? Then when I put the next layer on there, this one, it went down too and back up. It went down and back up. OK? Now, what do I want to do? I want this thing to go back and forth. Is it going to go back and forth? What happens? It's going to get it's stuck, isn't it? It can't go this way. Because it's got this, this thing, this artifact that's hanging down. So what do you do? How do you solve that problem? Any ideas? OK, you use CMP. And if we go over here, same structure, but after, after they added another step called CMP, now the oxide ended up being flat all the way across. Now, how did I do that? When I put the oxide down, it goes in here and comes back up, right? I'm giving you a hint. OK. You guys see that? Here, let me erase it. This is hard to do. It's going to be fun to watch on the video later. 
So remember, when we put the oxide down, it would go into that crevice. It's still going to do that when we deposit, isn't it? Okay, let me make it a little bit wider. So if I, what happens if I make it really thick? I'm still going to get that crevice, right? So our, our sacrificial layer will look like this. Remember, we only have that bottom piece in there, right? You see that? This is what we're doing. And when, when do you get this bottom? So we put the sacrificial oxide there, and then we're going to put the next layer on. But it's bumpy. So how do we get rid of the bumpiness? We use our magic eraser, right? We start polishing. We're polishing. We're doing chemical mechanical polishing. You see what we're doing? Now we have our oxide layer gap. Then what? We put our polycrystalline silicon down, and it's flat, isn't it? And then we pattern and etch that. But now we have a flat structure instead of a bumpy structure. And then when we're all done, we do the release step. We release the product so it can move. OK? Now we've got our polycrystalline silicon, our structural layer. It's flat, and it can easily move back and forth up and down, and it'll clear this stuff underneath. You don't have this thing going down anymore. Okay, does that help you guys? So remember, it used to be like this. So all we have to do is make the oxide thicker and then polish it back, and it gets rid of all the bumps. It's like when snow's falling in your backyard and you see the bumps, right? Oh, there's my, there's my uh, rake I left in the lawn. You can see the little bump, right? on top of the snow. Oh, there's the trash can that flipped over and you got a lot of snow. You're in Michigan now and you're not in Albuquerque, right? So you see these bumps. Well, you can take a, a two by four and flatten the snow so the top is all flat and you don't know what's underneath anymore. And then anything else that you put on top will be flat, right? That's what we're doing. So to get rid of the, um, this, this bumpiness, part here, this topography, we just made what's underneath flat. And now everything's flat. And that's called chemical mechanical polishing. And they actually use that a lot in semiconductors um, because they build, I think they have seven layers of metal and probably a few other layers before that. So they have maybe 10 or 15 layers of stuff. It gets really bumpy really fast. And it causes a lot of other problems. Not, nothing moves, right, in a computer chip. So you don't care about things moving because it's just wires and connectors. But the problem is, is if you get too much bumpiness, now you can't pattern over that well. You can't focus into those holes and those crevices or crevasses, right? All right, so that's why we have CMP. So we talked about that. be a question on that? Oh, there you go. So we got pros and cons of surface micromachining. Pros, cons. Pros is there's a lot of equipment out there that's made for computer chips that can be used to make surface micromachining MEMS. That's why it's so popular. I can go on eBay and buy a tool that used to be a half a million dollars. I can buy it for $30,000. Because the computer chip companies don't want it anymore. It's obsolete. But the MEMS companies, they make bigger stuff. You know, their parts are one micron and up. The computer chip companies make things that are like 50 microns, 100, I mean 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. So they need very fine tools. The old chips are no good anymore, right? So you can buy older equipment real cheap, so that's a pro. You, uh, you want to use surface micromachining because like computer chips, you want to make a lot of them at a time. So you do what's called batch processing, batch fabrication. Do a lot of things at one time. 
Um, polycrystalline silicon is a great mechanical material. In fact, there was an article on that that's extra credit, I think, in the crystallography unit. I think. Mm -hmm. Is it there? Okay. So, and, and who wrote that? Pister? Was it Pister who wrote that? Uh, polycrystalline silicon or, or, or silicon as a mechanical material or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a great little article. You can scan through it, look at the pictures. You get an idea of crystal orientation and all that. But they also look at the, the um, flexibility of the material. It's very flexible on a small scale. I, I got to play with uh, mirrors that were made out of polycrystalline silicon, and I had to push them up and stand them up. So I would get a probe underneath and push up on it. This is hard to do with a 100 micron size mirror. Okay. I broke a lot of them, but they bend. It's amazing how much that material bends. Even though it's a crystal, if it's very thin and small, it, you can bend it quite a bit, probably 20, 30 degrees before it snaps. You, know, you try to do that with a wafer, you can't bend it 30 degrees and it, it, it'll snap right away. Okay? Uh, mechanical devices can be integrated with logic components. So this is a three-axis accelerometer. Here's all your MEM stuff. And here's all your circuitry. So you can do everything on one chip. You have to be careful, right? Because remember, we have to release the processes here. We don't want to dissolve the oxides from there. The problem is, is you can only make flat structures. And since they're big and flat, they tend to stick to each other and not work. And you're limited to the semiconductor materials that work in those kind of processes. So if you want to use something else, some other material, it's a lot harder. You can make different components. So let's take a look at some of these. Does anybody know what this is? I might have shown this before. Did I? What is it? Comb drive. How do you remember that? They look like combs. This is a comb, right? Comb your hair. There's another comb. They're interdigitated, so they face each other. The two combs face each other, and the teeth go in between each other, right? You put a voltage on this set of combs, let's say a positive voltage. This set of combs is on ground. Um, the electrons come up, right? So you get a negative charge on this side. Remember, we made this side positive. Okay, so what happens? These teeth want to go that way. So they all get pulled in. Then, then what do you do? You get rid of the positive charge. Now the electrons see each other. They don't like each other. What are they going to do? Oh. Run away, right? So they all disappear. Run away. It's like Monty Python. Run away. So all the electrons run away. So now there's no force. There's no positive, no negative. What's, gonna, what's the comb going to do? It's going to want to go the other way, right? Because you've got these big springs here that want to push it back. And then you turn the voltage on and it does the same thing. So guess what? You can get this going this way, this way, this way, this way. I have a motor, right? That's how a mo what a motor is. Put an electrical signal in and you get motion coming out. I just created a motor. It's called an electro static comb drive. It doesn't work on current, it works on just charge distribution and attraction. That's why they call it electrostatic. Okay, so that's one really popular type of thing. This is a radio frequency switch. Okay, so this is a really interesting gadget. You can have, um, you can have a signal going through, right, in and out high frequency. If you want to get rid of that high frequency and quench it, you put voltages on these pads, which transfers a voltage here, and it gets attracted. Actually, the signal is going this way. I'm sorry, I misspoke. So if I put a voltage here, this will snap down and cause the signal going through this line to stop. They use radio frequency switches and cell phones. Okay, and other applications, but that's all you really need to know. 
All right, and then this is my favorite. This is our world's smallest chain. Okay, not official, unofficial. The distance from here to here, which is called the pitch. Pitch is from, from one spot to, the, to another spot in the same place. Okay, the same type of structure. That's called pitch. That is about 11 microns. Okay, and that's a real picture from our design competition. Uh, Paul Tafoya designed the, the, the uh, chain, and you can see how old it is because we wrote TVI here. So it's 2006 that we made that. All right? So that's an actual part. So we can make all sorts of things. There's stuff called saw sensors. What does saw stand for? Surface acoustic wave sensor. So if I put a wave on top of a material, I get a certain resonance, right? Nice wave. I get signal in, signal out. Everything's nice. Now I put a piece of, I put a mass on it, something heavy on it. That wave gets disturbed. It doesn't transfer energy from one side of the crystal to the other side, right? So I see a drop in signal. But I know something is on that surface now, disturbing it. So I have a sensor. It's like if you're on a trampoline, on one side of a trampoline, and someone's on the other side, and you start tapping it, and the other person has their hand on the other side, they can feel the vibration coming through, right? The trampoline. And now you throw a big rock in the middle of the trampoline. The stresses are all different. You won't feel the same vibration coming through, will you? Oh, you just detected something's on the trampoline. Shrink it down to 100 microns and you get the idea. So I can, I, can, um, I can coat the sensor surface with different things that specific molecules, specific antigens, specific um, bacteria stick to. And then I have a, a sensor. We already talked about the comb drive. That's a type of actuator, right? A speaker is an actuator. We showed the RF switch, that stands for radio frequency. Inertial sensors, we've talked about that, also known as accelerometers. Cantilevers, we've shown a few of those. And this one you may not know, T-R-A, T-R-A, stands for torsional ratchet actuators. So that's a big round gear, basically, and, you, and it moves back and forth like a clock unit and you can make things go round and round, okay? They're actually better motors than the comb drives. Uh, Sandy has replaced all their comb drives with torsional ratchet actuators. All right. Bulk I love this picture. Uh, the Native Americans um, carved out from the side of a cliff structures. I think they also built some structures in there too. So they did both. But carving out is like bulk micromachining, or bulk machining, right? They remove different parts, and then what's left is a village. It's an oversimplification, but you get the idea. I used to have a picture of the um, Mount Rushmore. In fact, that might be on the next. Um, well, do you know what Mount Rushmore is? It's the, it's the mountain that has the president's faces on it. It's very famous. Yeah, North or South Dakota, one of those places. South, okay. It's right by the Badlands, right? Yeah. So um, I used to use the analogy, you start with a mountain and you remove everything that doesn't look like a president. That's bulk machining. Okay? So you have that picture? You, you can do it on a small scale. Nope. And we looked at this. This should be extremely familiar now. <coughs> right? Yep. So what's the green stuff? Silicon nitride. What's this stuff? Silicon nitride on the other side of the wafer. Yep. Here's your 111 plane. Does it like to etch? No. Good. It does not like to etch. This is your 100 plane, right? The surface. That likes to etch. 
400 times faster than the 111. So it just etches all the way down till you get to the other side and stops because it doesn't etch silicon nitride. And here's a little broken silicon nitride left. This is one of the openings that was rotated, right? Okay, so that's bulk etching. We, we, we did that. We showed you that. Okay, and then you can make other kinds of um, devices. This is a microfluidic channel. Okay, so this part here is bulk etched. They etched probably through the silicon. It's pretty deep. And this they didn't etch as much, so that's another pattern step. This is pretty deep too. So they probably made these and this at the same time. And then they did the connection later. Okay? So this is a reservoir of stuff, some kind of reactant. And then this might be the waste stream, for all we know, or, or supplies it with some other kind of chemical. So I'm not sure what it was exactly used for, but you get the idea. There are uh, microfluidic channels built in. Okay, again, same kind of picture. This is a, the chip on a different design. Okay, there's the front. That's where the circuit is. It's on top of the crystalline... Uh, or the silicon nitride, excuse me. This is a piece of crystalline silicon. This got broken, right? We have a hole all the way through. So yes, we do make a hole all the way through the crystal. If you look from the back, you can see the same circuit from the back, okay? All right, hopefully the recording isn't corrupt. And then here's another example of bulk micromachining. Now remember when we etched, we, we etched in the upside down pyramid? You can also put photoresist on top and you can etch something that looks like a pyramid. Okay? So um, this right here is one, one, one plane. But now it's going out. Right? It's still the same plane. It looks like it's going out. And this is what, um, maybe the 110 or something plane right here? Okay, again, this is a 111. If you look at your cube, you can see the 111s are opposite of each other, okay, in your origami cube. So you can, you can see all that. So does that help you? Right, and what do you think these things are? That connect. This connects. And this connects over here. It's a circuit, right? It could be a circuit, but it's actually not. It's a good guess. If these weren't here, this bulk mass would float away, wouldn't it? These are springs. Okay? They're springs. So this, this thing in the middle, this is the frame. This is the bulk mass. So if you move the frame, right, the mass wants to stay still. And then the springs will start pulling it along. So that, that's what's going on here. But what do they have that say? Guess... Well, this is for one direction. It's a very good question, right? And it's out of plane. So if I draw a perpendicular to the surface at the top of the mass, right, here's x. Here's Z, Z, right? And here's Y, right? X, Y, Z. It's going to move up and down. It's constrained to move up and down the way this, these are set up. So this, this would be an accelerometer that works in the up and down direction. Now you could take that accelerometer and rotate it 90 degrees, and then you can do Y. And rotate it again, you can do X. So it could be used as part of a three-axis accelerometer. You just use three of them. Okay? Great questions. Ooh, that was cool. I don't know how I did that. Ugh. Blank spots in there, but that'll, that'll be all right. So there you go. More bulk micromachining. Okay, that was the pattern we used to use. You know, we'd have the squares, and then they were rotated. It's kind of hard to see. This is a low-resolution picture, but you get the idea. And we printed it on a wafer, okay? And we used silicon nitride to protect it underneath. If you look at the, how it works, 
Okay, and what you can make with it, okay, so this, this orange part here, this, is protecting the silicon from being etched. This is open, so we're etching a groove. Now, if we make this bigger, this opening, right, like we have here, you can etch all the way through, right? Because it follows the same um, plane. Here are the two planes meet and stop etching. <coughs> Here are the two planes don't meet and they make a little hole on the back side. Right? Mm -hmm. We have a nozzle. So we make a groove, microfluidic channel, make it bigger etch, right? bigger opening, can make a nozzle. So we can make a groove and a nozzle next to each other at the same time. All we have to do is change how far open that is. Now that's pretty straightforward. And then we can do what we did to make the membrane. We can open the back side and then etch from the back up. Now, this is a little different than ours. What they did here is they added a little bit of boron into the crystalline silicon. And if you add a little boron in the crystalline silicon, it stops the etching. The chemistry stops. It's like magic. So that's called an etch stop. So depending how deep you put the boron, okay, that determines how thick your membrane's going to be. So a lot of people do that. Instead of having silicon nitride as the membrane, they'll use crystalline silicon, they'll just dope it, and then when they etch it, it stops. Now if we use dry etch, we can also get anisotropic etching, but we can go straight through. We can have this kind of structure. It's a different kind of etching, okay? It doesn't care about the crystal orientation. So some dry etches can be used to make channels like that, and you can make them at different depths. All you do is time them for a different amount of time, and if you do it long enough, you can go all the way through and make it straight, okay? Now here is Noah's famous question. What's Noah's question? Anisotropic, isotropic. Now we know, right? Excellent question. So iso means the same in all directions. So it etched this far and this far about the same amount. So you can get these kind of structures. Which is handy if you want to make a little lens or a little optical surface, right? You might want that structure. Okay, and means not, so it's not the same in all directions. So it etched this way, not nearly as the same as in that direction. Okay, so the difference between iso and anisotropic. So we use potassium hydroxide, we did that in class. Actually, we use sodium hydroxide, but it provided us with the OHs to, to um, etch the crystalline substrate. If you look on your, uh, on your origami cubes, and you're welcome to take them with you, or we can leave them here, there's another type of etchant you can use for crystalline silicon, and that's called EDP. Ethylene diamine pyrocatechol. I probably did not pronounce that right. EDP is um, liked by the industry because you can do some specific type of etching and not mess up the electric circuits. Problem with EDP, it causes, um, it causes cancer it and it uh, may cause miscarriages. So they, they only use it when they have to. The industry doesn't like to mess with lawsuits and, you know, making their people sick because people usually work at these companies 20 to 30 years because they're good high paying jobs so you want to be extremely safe so they always have protective equipment and all of that so when they work with it they're very well protected tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide remember I use that term to say we use that for develop you can also etch crystalline silicon with the same stuff we learned that the hard way at TI um, we had an emergency in the, in the clean room. Everybody had to leave. Some of the wafers were stopped on the developer tool. They had a puddle of TMAH on them. 
We came back in, we cleaned it up, stripped the resist, put new resist on, continued processing. Then we found out those, the chips on those, on those wafers that were sitting in the developer died, didn't work. And the reason is, is because the TMAH started etching the crystalline silicon and, and destroying the transistors. Now we didn't know it, because you can't really see that. And then at the end of line, those, those wafers all failed in electrical tests, and we cross-sectioned them, which means we break it and look at it from the side, right? And we found that they were pitted. The, the crystalline silicon was pitted. Then they found out those were the wafers reworked when we had the emergency. Then we found out, we figured out that the TMAH etched the crystalline silicon. Really interesting. I thought it was. So you're, you're a detective. You play CSI when you're in a clean room environment and things go wrong. You have to figure out what went wrong. So it's like being a detective. Uh, sodium hydroxide is another material we use. And hydrazine is another one, or hydrazine. This is rocket fuel. They actually use that in semiconductors to etch things on occasion. Not so much anymore. Okay, bulk micromachining, we can do it wet or dry. Wet means we use liquid chemicals. Dry means we usually use a plasma etcher. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Right? We, what are the, the states of matter? Solid, liquid, gas, or vapor, and plasma. That's the fourth. That's 99.9% .9 of the universe... The mass is in the, in the state of being a plasma. The sun, right? Plasma is what's inside of the um, fluorescent lighting. Well, we can make plasma inside of a tool to do etching, right? Plasma torch, right? A flame is plasma, okay? It's not the stuff in your blood, okay? All right. So we can do dry etching using a plasma. And we can, we can do iso and ionosteotropic etching with plasma. Just depends on the materials and the chemistries you use. Okay? So there's different kinds of dry etch. There's RIE, reactive ion etching. There's isotropic plasma etching. There's ion milling. And there's vapor phase etching. So there's different ways to do the, the type to get those different structures. We're not going to go into detail on that. Here's another schematic of a three-axis accelerometer. Okay, I'm trying to see how this works. Okay. So this one, the bulk mass moves in X in this direction. This one, the bulk mass use, uh, moves in Y in this direction. And this is like the other one. It goes up and down out of plane. So if you can put all three of these structures together, you have a three-axis accelerometer. And how high are they now in the number of axes in your phone? They have six. Yeah, so they're, they're even doing the yaw, aren't they? They're doing yaw, pitch, and um, yaw, I never remember the other one. pitch. Pitch is this way. Yeah. Roll. Thank you. Roll. That's what they have in your phones now. They're going to nine axes. I don't know what the other three are. I haven't thought of that yet. Maybe it has something to do with time. Who knows? Multi-dimensional space, right? Okay. And then, you, you know, with bulk micromachining, like we said, you can make arrays of cantilevers, nozzles, fluidic channels, needle arrays. Needle arrays are fun. Atomic force microscope probes, membranes, chambers, and connections through the wafer. So through the wafer connections, you might say, well, when, when would you want to make a connection from the back to the front? There's a company that used to be in Albuquerque called Advent Solar. Solar panels are made by collecting the, the charge that the sun's photons produce in crystalline, polycrystalline silicon and then making electricity out of that. Well, you have to have wires running across to collect the, uh, the free electrons that the photons created. But the wires block the sun. Okay. So you only have, a, you have like 5% less area exposed. So what they did is they put the wires on the back and made them really thin, made the crystal and silicon really thin. So they had to make holes through the wafer to connect from the front to the back. And then that way they had more exposed area. Okay? 
So that's why a hole through away for that's one thing. Okay, Liga, I'm not going to spend as much time on. We're going to go through this real quick. Here's that structure again. We showed the cartoon earlier. This is the actual picture. Okay. So that was cool. Um, Liga stands for lithography, electroforming, which is electroplating, and molding. So you can make little tiny molds, and then you can use the molds to make other things. Or you can use the molds themselves as the primary thing. So this, this is actually after electroplating. So they double expose something that's like photoresist. It's called PMMA. I think that's one of the questions in the crossword puzzle. PMMA. Polymethyl methacrylate. It's a mouthful. It's also known as plexiglass. So you can use plexiglass as a photoresist and expose it to x-rays and then you can dissolve out the exposed plexiglass. And plexiglass you can make really thick, right? And you can make very, very fine structures using x-rays. So you can make very tall, skinny structures using x-rays. And we saw this um, picture before. That's a tall, very tall part. And actually, the part that was made with Liga is just the gear part. This inner part was put in later. Okay, this has all the ball bearings and stuff in it. Okay, but you can make extremely small stuff. This is actually quite big. Um, but try to machine a gear that way. You know, with a, with a lathe or something like that. It's very hard to do. So this was actually invented in Germany. I actually went to the place that does Liga, that started Liga. Um, there's some videos I have on that. Um, I used to show the students, but we just don't have time. Um, and they make high aspect ratio parts. Okay, and you can also make very high precise dimensions with very um, low surface roughness. Right, because you're doing a, an electroplating process, which is very smooth. When you electroplate like chrome bumpers or silverware or jewelry, it's very smooth, right? It's not like you put a bunch of stuff on there and then you sand it down. It's very, very smooth. Okay. You can read more. The way you do this. Um, instead of using chrome on glass, you got to use something that works with x-rays. So you use beryllium and gold. Gold is, your, um, is the thing that stops the x-rays. Then you shine x-rays through here. The x-rays don't go through gold, but it does go through the beryllium. And then it exposes the polymethyl methacrylate, the PMAA. Okay, and then the base, the substrate, is usually a metal plate of some kind. All right? There's so much cool stuff. Okay, and then once you expose the PMMA, you develop it. Remember, this is a backwards process. So where the, where the x-rays go through, it causes the PMMA to get harder. I, may, I might have misspoken earlier. And where there is no x-rays, you can dissolve it out. So this is a negative process. So they dissolved out the PMMA where the x-rays didn't hit. Now this red that you see through here, that's the, from the bottom plate. Okay, it's a thin layer of metal there. And then you can put a voltage on there. Okay, so why do you, would you put a voltage on there? Because you're going to electroplate. How many of you have heard of electroplating? A little bit, right? It's a chemistry thing. You might even teach it. You guys teach electroplating at all in chemistry? What's that? No? This would be a fun thing for students to do. We actually have a kit called the Liga kit where you can pattern um, a copper plate or actually an aluminum plate and then you can um, electroplate copper onto it. It's kind of fun. It's a little tricky. You have to spend a few days. You have to practice doing it. 
Um, I do it in my class every once in a while. Uh, not in this one, though, in the fabrication class. But anyway, remember we, we made that pattern, and then we throw this in a solution, and we add a voltage across here, and the electrolyte solution has ions in there of a, of a metal. They usually use nickel, but you can use copper and a few other materials work pretty well for electroplating. Chrome, right? We chrome plate a lot of things. And so once you get the voltage going, wherever you have metals showing, you're going to start plating. And when you're done plating, you fill up that pattern. See that? You fill it up with metal. So now it's filled up with metal. You still have the polymethyl methacrylate around there. Okay? And you can then uh, get rid of the polymethyl methacrylate, and you're left with the gear. Okay, so this was the, the mold, and now you're left with the gear. You could also be left with lines and spaces, and then you can stamp it into a plastic sheet, okay, and, and make thousands of, of microfluidic channels with one mold. That's usually what they do. They don't usually make gears, but this shows you how it works. So we made the gear, and then we released the gear from the substrate, and we have a free gear, free spinning gear. This is really neat because you can make structures like this, very tall, skinny structures. You say, well, why would I care? You can, you can put different voltages or voltages on here, and then you can collect bad things out of the water, use it as a filter. We already mentioned that. You can make really tall, skinny springs that work inside of those really tiny cameras. Or guess what? You, you ever see those watches advertised for 100 bucks? Right? Swiss made? Right? They're called the, by Stauer. I love those watches. Half of the parts in there are made with Liga. Okay, because they can make them very small, very precise, repeatable. The old days, they used to manufacture the gears by hand, right? The guy would sit there and work on a watch for a year, and then they'd sell it for $20,000, $40,000, right? But they do everything by hand. Now they can mass, ma mass produce the different springs and parts and gears and then assemble them, and they use things similar to Liga to do that. Okay, and this is a really cool thing. If you want to align, if you want to align fiber optics, why would I want to do that? Right, you want to put fiber optic in your home so you can get really high internet speeds. Right, you can put tons of data through one fiber optic cable. But if, every once in a while you have to align them and connect them. Well, these Liga parts, allow you to snap these in place and they're perfectly aligned. Can you see that way? Hmm? Yeah, if you do it right, they'll stay that way for a long time. Okay? So you can use it as a precision uh, fiber optic holder. A thousand other examples. These are really cool. Um, this one in the bottom left, what do you think this is? This is a heat exchanger. So inside of the, these two metal plates, you know, you have fluid coming in, fluid going out. Well, inside you get, a, you get lots of little tiny um, micron, 100 micron channels going through here, Very, a lot of them. Surface to volume ratio, you have a little tube, lots of volume, I mean lots of surface. You, you bring in 100, you know, Celsius water here and you get... Um, 20 Celsius degree water are out because the, the heat exchange is so high. And if you put this in an ice bath, you can cool things down really fast. Okay? Because you're making a high surface to volume ratio. So that's why surface to volume ratio is important. Okay? I don't know what kind of biosensors these are. These were made at HT Micro. So they made um, high aspect ratio stamps and then they they made these parts out of them. So HT Micro is an Albuquerque company that does Liga. They send their um, parts to be exposed. 
because they need x-ray exposure, they send it to uh, University of Louisiana. They have a synchrotron radiation source. And that's the type of x-rays you need. It's the size of a building, right? The, the light bulb is the size of a building. But you can make very good high aspect ratio parts. This one, how many know about uh, chromatography? Yep. A little bit, right? What is a chromatography? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. What's your question? Um, slightly related. Um, all these different ways of making things, do you think that as they get better with like 3D printers and stuff, they'll be able to just 3D print little things? Yeah, there's another micro uh, machining uh, method called electron deposition. So it's like a 3D printer, and you can make metal parts very, very small and build them up. And they have other systems where they spray the material down yeah. and then they bake it and it turns into a ceramic. So you can have oxides, like ceramic systems, so you can make very small high temperature uh, engines maybe. Or you can make metal parts that way. So yes, there are many ways to do this now. Okay. This is a three meter chroma, chromatography column. Three meters. Doesn't look like three meters, does it? It has a spiral channel in there that's three meters long. So chromatography, if I remember right, you put a material through there and it, and, and it spreads out based on the mass of the constituent um, atoms and molecules. Yep. So the lighter stuff goes further out and gets out of the column faster than the heavier stuff. So you put some material through it, usually a gas on one end, and That's then you the look. You can do liquid chromatography too with markers. Oh, okay. So this is gas. This one's gas. So you put a gas in one end, and then on the other end, the first thing out is the lightest stuff. So the helium comes out first, mm -hmm. right? And then, 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 I don't know, what's heavier, nitrogen or oxygen? Ooh, what is nitrogen? What is I don't remember. Oxygen 16, right? Yeah. So, so the nitrogen comes first, then the oxygen. So, so you break apart what's in the air. And then if you have carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, you know, you can see when those things come out. And, and that's why they use um, chromatography. But you need a pretty long tube to do that. And if you, if you spiral it, it works even better because the light stuff will bounce back and forth and go all the way down and the slow stuff travels even further, right? Because it's doing the zigzag through the tube at a slower speed. Because everything's the same temperature, but the velocity is dependent on the mass and the temperature. So the kinetic energy of the particles are about the same. But the heavier stuff moves slower than the lighter stuff. All right, enough said. I think I packed too much science. This is my favorite picture in MEMS. What is this? This is the Anka mascot. Anka is the, the group in Germany that started Liga. This is their mascot. This is their photograph. This photograph has been stolen so many times. Okay? And you say, Matt, you stole it too. Not true. We got permission. We were the first people ever to ask these guys if we could use their picture. They were so surprised. <laughs> this picture was, on, I think, on the cover of Nature or something, and they never said they could use it, you know? So, but, of course, they're not going to complain. Um, any, what's that? Who does the work? I don't know who does the dental work, but they shouldn't be hired. The ant's dental work isn't very good. There's his eye, even though this looks like eyes, but his, their eyes are on the side. But this, this, this is a Liga gear, and they put it on the foot of the ant, and then they colorized it, right, in Photoshop later. But this is an actual photograph, okay, a scanning electron microscope photograph. So this is pretty small stuff. So that's a, that's a really small Liga gear, the other gear I showed you. So, you know, in summary... What can we say? We talked about surface bulk and Liga. 
And as you pointed out, there's lots of other ways to do micromachining. There's a great free online magazine called Micromachining International, MMI. They have really good conferences. Um, they're for industry. They're based out of England. So when they do the American conference, it's a lot of fun because half of them are from Ireland. You can fill in the blanks there. Um, anyway, you know, surface micromachining, bulk micromachining, Liga are just three of a lot of different ways you can make small stuff. Okay, the, the, these are the major ones right now, but we're seeing a lot of um, hot plastic injection molding on the micron scale, which is mind-blowing. Because if you know how injection molding works, it's not easy to release the part out of the mold, especially when they're little, right? Because you have a lot of surface area again. Surface to volume ratio is high. What, what's happening at the surfaces in the mold? The, the, the material that you're putting into the mold is sticking to the mold, right? So you try to pull it out, you're going to damage it. So there's a lot of work being done. How do I make really good molds, very small? So the plastic, after I put the hot plastic in there and I want to pull the plastic part out and still have a good mold, how do I do that without destroying everything? So there's a lot of um, interesting work being done around that, and they've, they've done a lot of cool Okay? So any questions?